The Baker Street Readers present The Adventure of the Cardboard Box. From the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. By Arthur Conan Doyle. In choosing a few typical cases which illustrate the remarkable mental qualities of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I have endeavoured as far as possible to select those which presented the minimum of sensationalism, while offering a fair field for his talents. It is, however, unfortunately impossible entirely to separate the sensational from the criminal, and a chronicler is left in the dilemma that he must either sacrifice details which are essential to his statement, and so give a false impression of the problem, or he must use matter which chance and not choice has provided him with. With this short preface, I shall turn to my notes of what proved to be a strange, though a peculiarly terrible chain of events. It was a blazing hot day in August. Baker Street was like an oven, and the glare of the sunlight upon the yellow brickwork of the house across the road was painful to the eye. It was hard to believe that these were the same walls which loomed so gloomily through the fogs of winter. Our blinds were half drawn, and Holmes lay curled upon the sofa, reading and re-reading a letter which he had received by the morning post. For myself, my term of service in India had trained me to stand heat better than cold, and a thermometer of ninety was no hardship. But the morning paper was uninteresting. Parliament had risen, everybody was out of town, and I yearned for the glades of the new forest or the shingle of South Sea. A depleted bank account had caused me to postpone my holiday, and as to my companion, neither the country nor the sea presented the slightest attraction to him. He loved to lie in the very centre of five millions of people, with his filaments stretching out and running through them, responsive to every little rumour or suspicion of unsolved crime. Appreciation of nature found no place among his many gifts, and his only change was when he turned his mind from the evildoer of the town to track down his brother of the country. Finding that Holmes was too absorbed for conversation, I had tossed aside the barren paper, and leaning back in my chair, I fell into a brown study. Suddenly my companion's voice broke in upon my thoughts. You are right, Watson. It does seem a preposterous way of settling a dispute. Most preposterous, I exclaimed. And then suddenly, realizing how he had echoed the inmost thought of my soul, I sat up in my chair and stared at him in blank amazement. What is this, Holmes? I cried. This is beyond anything which I could have imagined. He laughed heartily at my perplexity. <laughs> you remember some little time ago when I read you the passage in one of Poe's sketches in which the close reasoner follows the unspoken thoughts of his companion, you were inclined to treat the matter as a mere tour de force of the author. On my remarking that I was constantly in the habit of doing the same thing, you expressed incredulity. Oh, no! Perhaps not with your tongue, my dear Watson, but certainly with your eyebrows. So when I saw you throw down your paper and enter upon a train of thought, I was very happy to have the opportunity of reading it off, and eventually of breaking into it, as a proof that I had been in rapport with you. But I was still far from satisfied. In the example which you read to me, the reasoner drew his conclusions from the actions of the man whom he observed. If I remember right, he stumbled over a heap of stones, looked up at the stars, and so on. But I have been quietly seated in my chair, and what clues can I have given you? You do yourself an injustice. The features are given to man as means by which he shall express his emotions, and yours are faithful servants. Do you mean to say that you have read my train of thoughts from my features? Your features, and especially your eyes. Perhaps you cannot yourself recall how your reverie commenced? No, I, I cannot. Then I will tell you. 
after throwing down your paper which was the action which drew my attention to you you sat for half a minute with a vacant expression then your eyes fixed themselves upon a newly framed picture of general gordon and i saw by the alteration in your face that a train of thought had started but it did not lead very far your eyes flashed across to the unframed portrait of henry ward beecher which stands upon the top of your books then you glanced up at the wall and of course your meaning was obvious you were thinking that if the portrait were framed it would just cover that bare space and correspond with gordon's picture over there you have followed me wonderfully so far i could hardly have gone astray but now your thoughts went back to beecher and you looked hard across as if you were studying the character in his features then your eyes ceased to pucker but you continued to look across and your face was thoughtful you were recalling the incidents of beecher's career i was well aware that you could not do this without thinking of the mission which he undertook on behalf of the north at the time of the civil war for i remember your expressing your passionate indignation at the way in which he was received by the more turbulent of our people you felt so strongly about it that i knew you could not think of beecher without thinking of that also when a moment later i saw your eyes wander away from the picture i suspected that your mind had now turned to the civil war and when i observed that your lips set your eyes sparkled and your hands clenched i was positive that you were indeed thinking of the gallantry which was shown by both sides in that desperate struggle but then again your face grew sadder you shook your head you were dwelling upon the sadness and horror and useless waste of life your hand stole towards your own old wound and a smile quivered on your lips which showed me that the ridiculous side of this method of settling international questions had forced itself upon your mind at this point i agreed with you that it was preposterous and was glad to find out that all my deductions had been correct absolutely and now that you have explained it i confess that i am as amazed as before it was very superficial my dear watson i assure you i should not have intruded it upon your attention had you not shown me some incredulity the other day but i have in my hands here a little problem which may prove to be more difficult of solution than my small essay in thought reading have you observed in the paper a short paragraph referring to the remarkable contents of a packet sent through the post to miss cushing of cross street croydon no i, I saw nothing ah then you must have overlooked it just toss it over to me here it is under the financial column perhaps you would be good enough to read it aloud i picked up the paper which he had thrown back to me and read the paragraph indicated it was headed a gruesome packet. Miss Susan Cushing, living at Cross Street, Croydon, has been made the victim of what must be regarded as a peculiarly revolting practical joke, unless some more sinister meaning should prove to be attached to the incident. At two o'clock yesterday afternoon, a small packet wrapped in brown paper was handed in by the postman. A cardboard box was inside, which was filled with coarse salt. On emptying this, Miss Cushing was horrified to find two human ears, apparently quite freshly severed. The box had been sent by parcel post from Belfast upon the morning before. There is no indication as to the sender, and the matter is the more mysterious as Miss Cushing, who is a maiden lady of fifty, has led a most retired life, and has so few acquaintances or correspondence that it is a rare event for her to receive anything through the post. Some years ago, however, when she resided at Penge, she let apartments in her house to three young medical students, whom she was obliged to get rid of on account of their noisy and irregular habits. The police are of the opinion that this outrage may have been perpetrated upon Miss Cushing by these youths, who owed her a grudge, and who hoped to frighten her by sending her these relics of the dissecting rooms. Some probability is lent to the theory by the fact that one of these students came from the north of Ireland and to the best of Miss Cushing's belief from Belfast. In the meantime, the matter is being actively investigated. Mr. Lestrade, 
one of the very smartest of our detective officers being in charge of the case. So much for the Daily Chronicle, said Holmes as I finished reading. Now for our friend Lestrade. I have a note from him this morning in which he says... I think that this case is very much in your line. We have every hope of clearing the matter up, but we find a little difficulty in getting anything to work upon. We have, of course, wired to the Belfast Post Office, but a large number of parcels were handed in upon that day, and, and they have no means of identifying this particular one or of remembering the sender. The box is an half-pound box of honeydew tobacco, and does not help us in any way. The medical student theory still appears to be to be the most feasible, but if you should have a few hours to spare, I should be very happy to see you out here. I shall be either at the house or in the police station all day. What say you, Watson? Can you rise superior to the heat and run down to Croydon with me on the off chance of a case for your annals? I was longing for something to do. You shall have it, then. Ring for our boots and tell them to order a cab. I'll be right back in a moment when I have changed my dressing gown and filled my cigar case. A shower of rain fell while we were in the train, and the heat was far less oppressive in Croydon than in town. Holmes had sent on a wire, so that Lestrade, as wiry, as dapper, and as ferret-like as ever, was waiting for us at the station. A walk of five minutes took us to Cross Street, where Miss Cushing resided. It was a very long street of two-story brick houses, neat and prim, with whitened stone steps and little groups of aproned women gossiping at the doors. Halfway down, the Strad stopped and tapped at a door, which was opened by a small servant girl. Miss Cushing was sitting in the front room, into which we were ushered. She was a placid-faced woman with large, gentle eyes and grizzled hair curving down over her temples on each side. A worked antimacassar lay upon her lap, and a basket of coloured silks stood upon a stool beside her. They are in the outhouse, those dreadful things, said she as Lestrade entered. I wish that you would take them away altogether. So I shall, Miss Cushing. I only kept them here until my friend, Mr. Holmes, should have seen them in your presence. Why in my presence, sir? In case he wished to ask any questions. What is the use of asking me questions when I tell you I know nothing whatever about it? Quite so, madam, said Holmes in his soothing way. I have no doubt that you have been annoyed more than enough already over this business. Indeed I have, sir. I am a quiet woman and live a retired life. It is something new for me to see my name in the papers and to find the police in my house. I won't have those things here, Mr. Lestrade. If you wish to see them, you must go to the outhouse. It was a small shed in the narrow garden which ran behind the house. The Strad went in and brought out a yellow cardboard box with a piece of brown paper and some string. There was a bench at the end of the path, and we all sat down while Holmes examined, one by one, the articles which Lestrade had handed to him. The string is exceedingly interesting, he remarked, holding it up to the light and sniffing at it. What do you make of this string, Lestrade? It has been tarred. Precisely. It is a piece of tarred twine. You have also no doubt remarked that Miss Cushing has cut the cord with the scissors, as can be seen by the double fray on each side. This is of importance. I uh, cannot see the importance. The importance lies in the fact that the knot is left intact, and that it is a knot of peculiar character. It is very neatly tied. I had already made a note to that effect. So much for the string, then, said Holmes, smiling. Now for the box wrapper. Brown paper with a distinct smell of coffee. What? Did you not observe it? I think there can be no doubt of it. A dress printed in rather straggling characters. Miss S. Cushing, Cross Street, Croydon, done with a broad-point pen, probably a J, and with very inferior ink. The word Croydon has been originally spelled with an I, which has been changed to a Y. The parcel was directed then by a man, the print is distinctly masculine, of limited education and unacquainted with the town of Croydon. So far, so good. 
The box is a yellow half-pound honeydew box with nothing distinctive save two thumb marks at the left bottom corner. It is filled with rough salt of the quality used for preserving hides and other coarser commercial purposes, and embedded in it are these very singular enclosures. He took out the two ears as he spoke, and laying a board across his knee, he examined them minutely, while Lestrade and I, bending forward on each side of him, glanced alternately at these dreadful relics, and at the thoughtful, eager face of our companion. Finally, he returned them to the box once more, and sat for a while in deep meditation. You have observed, of course, said he at last, that the ears are not a pair. Yes, I have noticed that. But if this were the practical joke of some students from the dissecting rooms, it would be as easy for them to send two odd ears as a pair. Precisely. But this is not a practical joke. You are sure of it? The presumption is strongly against it. Bodies in the dissecting rooms are injected with preservative fluid. These ears bear no signs of this. They are fresh, too. They have been cut off with a blunt instrument, which would hardly have happened if a student had done it. Again, carbolic or rectified spirits would be the preservatives which would suggest themselves to the medical mind, certainly not rough salt. I repeat that there is no practical joke here, but we are investigating a serious crime. A vague thrill ran through me as I listened to my companion's words and saw the stern gravity which had hardened his features. This brutal preliminary seemed to shadow forth some strange and inexplicable horror in the background. Lestrade, however, shook his head like a man who was only half convinced. Mm. There, there are objections to the joke theory, no doubt, but there are much stronger reasons against the other. We know that this woman has led a most quiet and respectable life at Penge and Ear for the last twenty years. She has hardly been away from her home for a day during that time. Why on earth, then, should any criminal send her the proofs of his guilt, especially as, oh, unless she is the most consummate actress, she understands quite as little of the matter as we do. That is the problem we have to solve, and for my part I shall set about by presuming that my reasoning is correct, and that a double murder has been committed. One of these ears is a woman's, small, finely formed, and pierced for an earring. The other is a man's, sunburned, discoloured, and also pierced for an earring. These two people are presumably dead, or we should have heard their story before now. Today is Friday. The packet was posted on Thursday morning. The tragedy, then, occurred on Wednesday or Tuesday or earlier. If these two people were murdered, who but their murderer would have sent this sign of his work to Miss Cushing? We may take it that the sender of the packet is the man whom we want, but he must have had some strong reason for sending Miss Cushing this packet. What reason, then? It must have been to tell her that the deed was done, or to pain her, perhaps. But in that case she knows who it is. Does she know? I doubt it. If she knew, why should she call the police in? She might have buried the ears, and no one would have been the wiser. That is what she would have done if she had wished to shield the criminal. But if she does not wish to shield him, she would give his name. There is a tangle here which needs straightening out. He had been talking in a high, quick voice staring blankly up over the garden fence. But now he sprang briskly to his feet and walked towards the house. I have a few questions to ask Miss Gushing. In that case, I may leave you here, for I have another small business on hand. I think that I have nothing further to learn from Miss Cushing. You will find me at the police station. We shall look in on our way to the train, answered Holmes. A moment later, he and I were back in the front room, where the impassive lady was still quietly working away at her antimacassar. She put it down on her lap as we entered, and looked at us with her frank, searching blue eyes. I am convinced, sir, that this matter is a mistake, and that the parcel was never meant for me at all. I have said this several times to the gentleman from Scotland Yard, but he simply laughs at me. I have not an enemy in the world as far as I know, so why should anyone play me such a trick? I am coming to be of the same opinion, Miss Cushing. 
said Holmes, taking a seat beside her. I think that it is more than probable. He paused, and I was surprised on glancing round to see that he was staring with singular intentness at the lady's profile. Surprise and satisfaction were both for an instant to be read upon his eager face, though when she glanced round to find out the cause of his silence, he had become as demure as ever. I stared myself at her flat, grizzled hair, her trim cap, her little gilt earrings, her placid features, but I could see nothing which could account for my companion's evident excitement. There were one or two questions. Oh, I am weary of questions. You have two sisters, I believe. How could you know that? I observed the very instant I entered the room that you have a portrait group of three ladies upon the mantelpiece, one of whom is undoubtedly yourself, while the others are so exceedingly like you that there could be no doubt of the relationship. Well, yes, you are quite right. Those are my sisters, Sarah and Mary. And here at my elbow is another portrait, taken at Liverpool, of your younger sister, in the company of a man who appears to be a steward by his uniform. I observed that she was unmarried at the time. You are very quick at observing. That is my trade. Well, you are quite right. But she was married to Mr. Browner a few days afterwards. He was on the South American line when that was taken, but he was so fond of her that he couldn't abide to leave her for so long, and he got into the Liverpool and London boats. Ah, oh, the Conqueror, perhaps. No, the May Day, when last I heard. Jim came down here to see me once. That was before he broke the pledge. But afterwards he would always take drink when he was ashore, and a little drink would send him stark staring mad. Oh, it was a bad day that ever he took a glass in his hand again. First he dropped me, then he quarreled with Sarah, and now that Mary has stopped writing, we don't know how things are going with them. It was evident that Miss Cushing had come upon a subject on which she felt very deeply. Like most people who lead a lonely life, she was shy at first, but ended by becoming extremely communicative. She told us many details about her brother-in-law, the steward, and then wandering off on the subject of her former lodgers, the medical students, she gave us a long account of their delinquencies, with their names and those of their hospitals. Holmes listened attentively to everything, throwing in a question from time to time. About your second sister, Sarah, I wonder, since you are both maiden ladies, that you do not keep house together. Ah, oh, you don't know Sarah's temper, you would wonder no more. I tried it when I came to Croydon, and we kept on until about two months ago, when we had to part. I don't want to say a word against my own sister, but she was always meddlesome and hard to please, was Sarah. You say that she quarreled with your Liverpool relations? Yes, and they were the best of friends at one time. Why, she went up there to live in order to be near them. And now she has no word hard enough for Jim Browner. The last six months that she was here, she would speak of nothing but his drinking and his ways. He had caught her meddling, I suspect, and given her a bit of his mind. And that was the start of it. Thank you, Miss Cushing, said Holmes, rising and bowing. Your sister Sarah lives, I think you said, at New Street, Wallington? Good-bye. And I am very sorry that you should have been troubled over a case with which, as you say... You have nothing whatever to do. There was a cab passing as we came out, and Holmes hailed it. How far to Wallington? Only about a mile, sir. Very good. Jump in, Watson. We must strike while the iron is hot. Simple as the case is, there have been one or two very instructive details in connection with it. Uh, just pull up at the telegraph office as you pass, cabby. Holmes sent off a short wire and for the rest of the drive lay back in the cab, with his hat tilted over his nose to keep the sun from his face. Our driver pulled up at a house which was not unlike the one which we had just quitted. My companion ordered him to wait, and had his hand upon the knocker, when the door opened, and a grave young gentleman in black with a very shiny hat appeared on the step. Is Miss Cushing at home? Miss Sarah Cushing is extremely ill. She has been suffering since yesterday from brain symptoms of great severity. As her medical adviser, I cannot possibly take the responsibility of allowing anyone to see her. I should recommend you to call again in ten days. He drew on his gloves, closed the door, and marched off down the street. Well, if we can't, we can't. Perhaps she could not or would not have told you much. I did not wish her to tell me anything. I only wanted to look at her. 
However, I think I have got all I want. Drive us to some decent hotel, cabby, where we may have some lunch, and afterwards we shall drop down upon friendless Strahd at the police station. We had a pleasant little meal together, during which Holmes would talk about nothing but violins, narrating with great exultation how he had purchased his own Stradivarius, which was worth at least five hundred guineas, at a Jew broker's in Tottenham Court Road for fifty-five shillings. This led him to Paganini, and we sat for an hour over a bottle of claret while he told me anecdote after anecdote of that extraordinary man. The afternoon was far advanced, and the hot glare had softened into a mellow glow before we found ourselves at the police station. The Strad was waiting for us at the door. A telegram for you, Mr. Holmes. Ha! It is the answer. He tore it open, glanced his eyes over it, and crumpled it into his pocket. Mm. That's all right. Have you found out anything? I have found out everything. What? Lestrade stared at him in amazement. You are joking. I was never more serious in my life. A shocking crime has been committed, and I think I have now laid bare every detail of it. And the criminal? Holmes scribbled a few words upon the back of one of his visiting cards and threw it over to Lestrade. That is the name. You cannot effect an arrest until tomorrow night at the earliest. I should prefer that you do not mention my name at all in connection to the case, as I choose only to be associated with those crimes which present some difficulty in their solution. Come on, Watson. We strode off together to the station, leaving Lestrade still staring with a delighted face at the card which Holmes had thrown him. The case, said Sherlock Holmes, as we chatted over our cigars that night in our rooms at Baker Street, is one where, as in the investigations which you have chronicled under the names of A Study in Scarlet and of The Sign of Four, we have been compelled to reason backward from effects to causes. I have written to Lestrade, asking him to supply us with the details which are now wanting, and which he will only get after he has secured his man. That he may be safely trusted to do, for although he is absolutely devoid of reason, he is as tenacious as a bulldog when once he understands what he has to do. And, indeed, it is just this tenacity which has brought him to the top at Scotland Yard. Your case is not complete, then? It is fairly complete in the essentials. We know who the author of the revolting business is, although one of the victims still escapes us. Of course, you have formed your own conclusions. I presume that this Jim Browner, the steward of a Liverpool boat, is the man whom you suspect? Oh, it is more than a suspicion. And yet I cannot see anything save very vague indications. On the contrary, to my mind nothing could be more clear. Let me run over the principal steps. We approach the case, as you remember, with an absolutely blank mind, which is always an advantage. We have formed no theories. We were simply there to observe and to draw inferences from our observations. What did we see first? A very placid and respectable lady, who seemed quite innocent of any secret, and a portrait which showed me that she had two younger sisters. It instantly flashed across my mind that the box might have been meant for one of these. I set the idea aside as one which could be disproved or confirmed at our leisure. Then we went to the garden, as you remember, and we saw the very singular contents of the little yellow box. The string was of the quality which is used by sailmakers aboard ship, and at once the whiff of the sea was perceptible in our investigation. When I observed that the knot was one which is popular with sailors, that the parcel had been posted at a port, and that the male ear was pierced for an earring which is so much more common among sailors than landsmen, I was quite certain that all the actors in the tragedy were to be found among our seafaring classes. When I came to examine the address of the packet, I observed that it was to Miss S. Cushing. Now, the oldest sister would, of course, be Miss Cushing, and although her initial was S, it might belong to one of the others as well. 
"'In that case we should have to commence our investigation from a fresh basis altogether. I therefore went into the house with the intention of clearing up this point. I was about to assure Miss Cushing that I was convinced that a mistake had been made, when you may remember that I came suddenly to a stop. The fact was, I had just seen something which filled me with surprise, and at the same time narrowed the field of our inquiry immensely. As a medical man, you are aware, Watson, that there is no part of the body which varies so much as the human ear. Each ear is, as a rule, quite distinctive, and differs from all other ones. In last year's anthropological journal you will find two short monographs from my pen upon the subject. I had, therefore, examined the ears in the box with the eyes of an expert, and had carefully noted their anatomical peculiarities. Imagine my surprise, then, when, on looking at Miss Cushing, I perceived that her ear corresponded exactly with the female ear which I had just inspected. The matter was entirely beyond coincidence. There was the same shortening of the pinna, the same broad curve of the upper lobe, the same convolution of the inner cartilage. In all essentials it was the same ear. Of course I at once saw the enormous importance of the observation. It was evident that the victim was a blood relation, and probably a very close one. I began to talk to her about her family, and you remember that she at once gave us some exceedingly valuable details. In the first place, her sister's name was Sarah, and her address had until recently been the same, so that it was quite obvious how the mistake had occurred, and for whom the packet was meant. We then heard of this steward, married to the third sister, and learned that he had at one time been so intimate with Miss Sarah that she had actually gone up to Liverpool to be near the Browners, but a quarrel had afterwards divided them. This quarrel had put a stop to all communications for some months, so that if Browner had occasion to address a packet to Miss Sarah, he would undoubtedly have done so to her old address and now the matter had begun to straighten itself out wonderfully. We had learned of the existence of this steward, an impulsive man of strong passions. You remember that he threw up what must have been a very superior birth in order to be nearer to his wife, subject, to to occasional fits of hard drinking. We had reason to believe that his wife had been murdered, and that a man, presumably a seafaring man, had been murdered at the same time. Jealousy, of course, at once suggests itself as a motive for the crime. And why should these proofs of the deed be sent to Miss Sarah Cushing? Probably because during her residence in Liverpool she had some hand in bringing about the events which led to the tragedy. You will observe that this line of boats calls at Belfast, Dublin, and Waterford, so that, presuming that Browner had committed the deed and had embarked at once upon his steamer, the May Day, Belfast would have been the first place he could post his terrible packet. A second solution was at this stage obviously possible and although I thought it exceedingly unlikely, I was determined to elucidate it before going further. An unsuccessful lover might have killed Mr. and Mrs. Browner, and the male ear might have belonged to the husband. There were many grave objections to this theory, but it was conceivable. I therefore sent off a telegram to my friend Algar of the Liverpool force, and asked him to find out if Mrs. Browner were at home, and if Browner had departed in the May Day. We then went on to Wallington to visit Miss Sarah. I was curious in the first place to see how far the family ear had been reproduced in her. Then, of course, she might give us very important information, but I was not sanguine that she would. She must have heard of the business the day before, since all Croydon was ringing with it, and she alone could have understood for whom the packet was meant. 
and if she had been willing to help justice she would have probably have communicated with the police already. However, it was clearly our duty to see her, so we went. We found that the news of the arrival of the packet, for her illness dated from that time, had had such an effect upon her as to bring on brain fever. It was clearer than ever that she understood its full significance, but equally clear that we should have to wait some time for any assistance from her. However, we were really independent of her help. Our answers were waiting for us at the police station, where I had directed Algar to send them. Nothing could be more conclusive. Mrs. Browner's house had been closed for more than three days, and the neighbours were of the opinion that she had gone south to see her relatives. It had been ascertained at the shipping offices that Browner had left aboard of the May Day, and I calculate that she is due in the Thames to-morrow night. When he arrives he will be met by the obtuse but resolute Lestrade, and I have no doubt that we shall have all our details filled in. Sherlock Holmes was not disappointed in his expectations. Two days later he received a bulky envelope, which contained a short note from the detective and a typewritten document, which covered several pages of foolscap. Lestrade has got him all right, said Holmes, glancing up at me. Perhaps it would interest you to hear what he says. My dear Mr. Holmes, in accordance with the scheme which we had formed in order to test our theories— That we is rather fine, Watson, is it not? I went down to the Albert Dock yesterday at 6 p.m. and boarded the SS May Day, belonging to the Liverpool, Dublin and London Steam Packet Company. On inquiry, I found that there was a steward on board of the name of James Browner, and that he had acted during the voyage in such an extraordinary manner that the captain had been compelled to relieve him of his duties. On descending to his berth, I found him seated upon a chest, with his head sunk upon his hands, rocking himself to and fro. He is a big, powerful chap, clean-shaven and very swarthy, something like Aldridge, who helped us in the bogus laundry affair. He jumped up when he heard my business, and I had my whistle to my lips to call a couple of river police who were round the corner, but he seemed to have no heart in him, and he held out his hands quietly enough for the derbies. We brought him along to the cells and his box as well, for we thought there might be something incriminating, but, bar a big sharp knife, such as most sailors have, we got nothing for our trouble. However, we find that we shall want no more evidence, for on being brought before the inspector at the station, he asked leave to make a statement, which was, of course, taken down, just as he made it, by our shorthand man. We had three copies typewritten, one of which I enclose. The affair proves, as I always thought it would, to be an extremely simple one, but I am much obliged to you for assisting me in my investigation. With kind regards, yours very truly, G. Lestrade. Hmm. The investigation really was a very simple one, but I don't think it struck him in that light when he first called us in. However, let us see what Jim Browner has to say for himself. This is his statement, as made before Inspector Montgomery at the Shadwell Police Station, and it has the advantage of being verbatim. Have I anything to say? Yes, I have a deal to say. I have to make a clean breast of it all. You can hang me, or you can leave me alone. I don't care, plug which you do. I tell you I've not shut an eye in sleep since I did it. And I don't believe I ever will again until I'm past all waking. Sometimes it is faith, but most generally it is. I'm never without one or the other before me. He looks frowning and black-like, but she has kind of a surprise upon her face. Aye, the white lamb. She might well be surprised when she read death on a face that had seldom looked anything but love upon her before. But it was Sarah's fault, and may the curse of a broken man put a blight on her and set the blood rotten in her veins. It's not that I want to clear myself. I know I went back to drink like the beast that I was. But she would have forgiven me. She would have stuck as close to me as a rope to the block if that woman had not darkened our door. 
for Sarah Cushing loved me. That's the root of the business. She loved me until all her love turned to poisonous hate when she knew that I thought more of my wife's footmark in the mud than I did of her whole body and soul. There were three sisters all together. The old one was just a good woman, the second was a devil, and the third was an angel. Sarah was thirty-three, and Mary was twenty-nine when I married. We were just as happy as the day was long when we set up house together, and in all Liverpool there was no better woman than my Mary. And then we asked Sarah up for a week, and a week grew into a month, and one thing led to another, until she was just one of ourselves. I was blue ribbon at the time, and we were putting a little money by, and all was as bright as a new dollar. My God, whoever would have thought that it could have come to this? Whoever would have dreamed it? I used to be home for the weekends very often, and sometimes if the ship were held back for cargo I would have a whole week at a time, and in this way I saw a good deal of my sister-in-law Sarah. She was a fine, tall woman, black and quick and fierce, with a proud way of carrying her head, and a glint from her eye like a spark from a flint. But when my Mary was there, I never had a thought to her, and that I swear as I hope for God's mercy. It had seemed to me sometimes that she liked to be alone with me, or to coax me out for a walk with her, but I never thought anything of that. But one evening my eyes were opened. I had come up from the ship and found my wife out, but Sarah at home. Where's Mary? I asked. Oh, she has gone to pay some accounts. I was impatient and paced up and down the room. Well, can't you be happy for five minutes without Mary, Jim? Says she. It's a bad compliment to me that you can't be contented with my society for so short a time. That's all right, my lass, I said, putting out my hand towards her in a kindly way. But she had it in both hers in an instant, and they burned as if they were in a fever. I looked into her eyes, and I read it all there. There was no need for her to speak, nor for me either. I frowned and drew my hand away. Then she stood by my side in silence for a bit, and then put up her hand and patted me on the shoulder. <laughs> Steady old Jim, <laughs> said she, and with a kind of a mocking laugh she ran out of the room. Well, from that time Sarah hated me with her whole heart and soul, and she is a woman who can hate too. I was a fool to let her go biding with us, a bespotted fool, but I never said a word to Mary, for I knew it would grieve her. Things went on much as before, but after a time I began to find that there was a bit of a change in Mary herself. She had always been so trusting and so innocent, but now she became queer and suspicious, wanting to know where I'd been and what I'd been doing, and whom my letters were from, and what I had in my pockets, and a thousand such follies. Day by day she grew queerer and more irritable, and we had ceaseless rows about nothing. I was fairly puzzled by it all. Sarah avoided me now, but she and Mary were just inseparable. I can see now how she was plotting and scheming and poisoning my wife's mind against me, but I was such a blind beetle that I could not understand it at the time. Then I broke my blue ribbon, and began to drink again. But I think I should not have done it if Mary had been the same as ever. She had some reason to be disgusted with me now, and the gap between us began to be wider and wider. And then this Alec Fabin chipped in, and things became a thousand times blacker. It was to see Sarah that first he came to my house, but soon it was to see us, he was a man with winning ways, and he made friends wherever he went. He was a dashing, swaggering chap, smart and curled, who had seen half the world and could talk of what he'd seen. He was good company, I won't deny it, and he had wonderful polite ways with him for a sailor man, so I think that there must have been some time where he knew more of the poop than of the forecastle. For a month he was in and out of my house, and never once did it cross my mind that arm might come of his soft, tricky ways. And then at last something made me suspect, and from that day my peace was gone forever. 
"'Twas only a little thing, too. "'I had come into the parlour unexpected, "'and as I walked in at the door "'I saw a light of welcome on my wife's face. "'But as she saw who it was, it faded again, "'and she turned away with a look of disappointment. "'That was enough for me. "'There was no one but Alec Fab on whose step she could have mistaken for mine.' If I could have seen him then, I should have killed him, for I've always been like a madman when my temper gets loose. Mary saw the devil's light in my eyes, and she ran forward with her hands on my sleeve. Don't, Jim, don't, says she. Where's Sarah? I asked. In the kitchen, says she. Sarah, says I, as I went in. This man, Fairburn, is to never darken my door again. Why not? says she. "'Because I order it,' Oh, says she. "'If my friends are not good enough for this house, "'then I am not good enough for it either.' "'You can do as you like,' says I. "'But if Fabin shows his face here again, "'I'll send you one of his ears for a keepsake.' "'She was frightened by my face, I think, "'but she never answered a word, "'and that same evening she left my house.' Well, I don't know whether it was pure devilry on the part of this woman, or whether she thought that she could turn me against my wife by encouraging her to misbehave. Anyway, she took a house just two streets off and let lodgings to sailors. Fairburn used to stay there, and Mary would go round to have tea with her sister and him. How often she went, I, I don't know, but I followed her one day, and as I broke in at the door, Fairburn got away over the garden wall like the cowardly skunk that he was. I swore to my wife I would kill her if I found her in his company again, and I led her back with me, sobbing and trembling as white as a piece of paper. There was no trace of love between us any longer. I could see that she hated me and feared me, and the thought of it drove me to drink, and then she despised me as well. Well, Sarah found that she could not make a living in Liverpool, and she went back, as I understand, to live with her sister in Croydon, and things jogged on much as the same at ever at home. And then came this last week, and all the misery and ruin. It was in this way... We had gone on the May Day for a round voyage of seven days, but a hogshead got loose and started one of our plates so that we had to put in port for twelve hours. I left the ship and came home, thinking what a surprise it would be for my wife, and hoping that maybe she would be glad to see me so soon. The thought was in my head as I turned onto my own street, and at that moment a cab passed me, and there she was, sitting by the side of Fairburn, the two chatting and laughing, with never a thought for me as I stood watching them from the footpath. I tell you, and I give you my word for it, that from that moment I was not my own master, and it is all like a dim dream when I look back on it. I had been drinking hard of late, and the two things together fairly turned my brain. There's something throbbing in my head now, like a docker's hammer. But that morning I seemed to have all Niagara whizzing and buzzing in my ears. Well, I took to my heels and I ran after them. I had a heavy oak stick in my hand and I tell you I saw red from the first. But as I ran I got cunning too. And I hung back a little to see them without being seen. They pulled up soon at the railway station. There was a good crowd round the booking office so I got quite close to them without being seen. They took two tickets for New Brighton. So did I, but I got in three carriages behind them. When we reached it, they walked along the parade, and I was never more than a hundred yards from them. At last I saw them hire a boat and start for a row, for it was a very hot day, and they thought, no doubt, that it would be cooler on the water. It was just as if they'd been given into my hands. There was a bit of a haze, and you could not see more than a hundred yards. I hired a boat for myself, and I pulled after them. I could see the blur of their craft, but they were going nearly as fast as I, and they must have been a long mile from the shore before I caught them. The haze was like a curtain all round us, 
and there were we three in the middle of it. My God, shall I ever forget their faces when I saw who it was in the boat that was closing in upon them? She screamed out. He swore like a madman and jabbed at me with an oar, for he must have seen death in my eyes. I got past it and got one with my stick that crushed his head like an egg. I would have spared her, perhaps, for all my madness, but she threw her arms around him, crying out to him, calling him Alec. I struck again, and she laid stretched beside him. I was like a wild beast then that had tasted blood. If Sarah had been there by the Lord, she would have joined them. I pulled out my knife, and... Well, there, I've said enough. It gave me a kind of savage joy when I thought of how Sarah would feel when she had such signs as these of what her meddling had brought about. Then I tied the bodies into the boat, stove a plank, and stood by until they had sunk. I knew very well that the owner would think that they had lost their bearings in the haze and had drifted off out to sea. I cleaned myself up, got back to land, and joined my ship without a soul having a suspicion of what had passed. That night I made a packet for Sarah Cushion, and the next day I sent it from Belfast. There you have the whole truth of it. You can hang me, or do what you like with me, but you cannot punish me as I have been punished already. I cannot shut my eyes, but I see those two faces staring at me, staring at me as they stared at my boat when I broke through the haze. I killed them quick, but they are killing me slow, and if I have another night of it I shall be either mad or dead before the morning. You won't put me alone into a cell, sir. For pity's sake, don't. And may you be treated in your day of agony as you treat me now. What is the meaning of it, Watson? Said Holmes solemnly as he laid down the paper. What object is to be served by this circle of misery and violence and fear? It must tend to some end, or else our universe is ruled by chance, which is unthinkable. But what end? There is the great standing perennial problem to which human reason is as far from an answer as ever. The Adventure of the Cardboard Box by Arthur Conan Doyle With James Gelter as Sherlock Holmes and Jim Browner Tony Grobe as Dr. Watson and the Cabman Featuring Jonathan Kinnersley as Inspector Lestrade and the Doctor. Shannon Ward as Susan Cushing and Sarah Cushing. And Jessica Gelter as Mary Cushing. Baker Street theme performed by Jonathan Kinnersley. Produced by James Gelter, Tony Grobe, and Kirby Landers. Directed by James Gelter. And welcome to After the Read, Cardboard Box Edition. I am your co-host, Jay Gelter. And I'm your co-host, Tony Grobe. And we are here to talk Cardboard Box. Business first, we would like to thank all of our patrons for subscribing to the Baker Street Readers podcast, especially those patrons who are at the detective level, Anna Behrens, Don Grobe, Donna Harlow, and Holly Kennedy. If you would like a shout out at the end of an episode, by all means, upgrade yourself to the detective level uh, it, and you will forever receive our gratitude. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you're enjoying this podcast, please, please share it on social media, post on your Facebook or your Twitter or whatever, how much you're enjoying it and make sure that you put a link to patreon.com slash Baker Street readers uh, so other people can enjoy the adventure of that we're all on together mm. and if you have any uh 
questions for us or thoughts about that you'd like to share with us, you can always email us at bakerstreetreaders at gmail.com. Uh, you can ask us questions about uh, uh, any of the stories that we've read so far in the podcast, uh, anything in the canon that you want to ask us about, our personal opinions, or just any questions about the process uh, of how we record uh, these shows. Uh, we'd be happy to read those questions in a future episode and give you an answer. For example, Tony. Do you have mm. a question to ask me about any of those things I just mentioned? Um, well, I think I do. How do we choose the stories that we end up presenting, Mr. Gelter? Why, thank you for asking. Mm. Um, right now we're pulling from the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. We did our live shows, and our first season of live shows we pulled just from the first collection of short stories. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Our second season that we had just started of live shows, we were pulling from the second collection, The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. And so that's what we've been pulling from this time round. Mm -hmm. but what's nice about doing the podcast is the live shows, we were only going to be able to do six or seven of them. The podcast, we can do as many as we want. So we can do a bunch of stories that we had not planned on doing. Cardboard box. Mm -hmm being one of them which ones we do in what order we're not really doing them in order of publication um, basically what we're doing is which ones are interesting to us in the moment and we feel that we can uh cast uh mm -hmm. with the people who are available any given uh week but thank you and tony i have mm. a question for you you do i do which of the stories either ones that we've performed live or done so far as a podcast which is your favorite story for watson that is a very interesting question i know i'm good aren't i you are <laughs> um are we counting baskerville yeah we can count baskerville okay because i think i mean that's that's definitely the meatiest one i think from uh from watson's perspective um there's a whole he, there's yeah. There's a whole section in the middle where he considers himself to be handling things on his own and is reporting back to Watson, which are, or back to uh, Holmes, which I always find interesting. Right. Um, he's he's really the he's really the protagonist of that story. Yeah. 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 The longer format of the novel gives uh, gives uh, Conan Doyle the chance to to put in some really beautiful descriptions of the scenery and things as as they're traveling which uh, are, are poetic and lovely, and I enjoy them a great deal. See, I thought you were going to answer, you love any story where Watson gets to talk about a woman's silhouetted figure. Well, you know, those are right <laughs> up there. Yeah. Those are right up there. I mean, it, 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 they, there were several in the, uh, in the adventures that featured that kind of uh, moment yeah. where we pull up to a, a house in a carriage and a, a woman comes out all excited that we're arriving and uh is silhouetted against the light behind her yes and you describe her chiffon indeed yes. indeed her translucent gown yes <laughs> um, all right. well uh move, <laughs> move on to a new and i hope regular segment no not reg i hope not a regular <laughs> segment. the uh corrections department section mm. of the podcast mm. uh um, errata you're right, in which we correct things that we got wrong in the last episode. Um, I got, we got a couple messages, and yes, I admit, I said Valley of Fear in the last episode when I meant to say Sign of Four. Mm -hmm. And I, I did know which story I was talking about in my head, and I just, I said the wrong one. But um, <laughs> these things happen. Yes, yes. Uh, but I'm glad to be given correction. Uh, I, <laughs> I, want, I, wanna, I want for us to steal a, uh, a saying from the James Bonding podcast, uh, which is a favorite podcast of mine. We are lovers, not experts. But anyway, let's talk cardboard box. Indeed. Tony, first impressions, <laughs> cardboard box. Oh, it's, it's a compelling story. I think 
both from the rather macabre introduction of the uh, the problem of the play, and also the play. You can well, tell we're actors of the, of the story. <laughs> yes, um, and also of the very relatable retelling of the events by the the villain of the tale. I, I quite like it. I quite yeah, like it, it. It's one of my personal favorites, and mm-hmm. I remember when we a while ago when we were still doing the live shows at one point we were reviewing what we were doing for the season and i went wait are we not doing cardboard box why did we decide not to do cardboard box cardboard box is great Um, yeah yeah i can't remember why we didn't decide to do that one well i either i do now recall and it it Mm. has to do with something that we'll 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 get to later in the conversation about about it but i also i really love how dark it is for Holmes. Mm -hmm. um it involves an affair, and we we were talking about this when we were recording it. Mm-hmm. Is there another Sherlock Holmes story in which an affair is a main plot point? Mm-hmm. And we we couldn't come up with any in that conversation, and I haven't thought of one yet. Um, no, uh, because there are different stories where affairs are kind of like red herrings, mm-hmm. like Baskerville. There's the oh, is is the butler having an affair? Oh, the the one that we just did, Crooked Man, Holmes considers maybe the murder victim was having an affair and then mm-hmm. goes, no, that can't be it. Listeners, don't email us a question. Email us an answer. Mm-hmm. Let us know if you can think of another Sherlock Holmes story in the canon in which an affair is a major plot point. We'd like to know. We're still learning. Let's break down a few facts of this of this story. It was first published in the Strand magazine in January 1893. Um, 1893. So it was published at the same time where he was monthly publishing all the short stories that would end up being the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. But this one has a controversial publishing history because mm-hmm. it was not included in the original edition of the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. because the public reaction to it was scandalous. Oh, dear. I think in part because it involved an affair, but also just how gruesome the murder was. Mm -hmm. This crime of passion and the de-earing of the the victims and all that. Certainly much more graphically described than... uh than even the murders in some other Sherlock Holmes stories. Right. But he doesn't even describe the cutting the ears off. He gets to that point. And he's yeah. like, but I won't tell you about that part. Mm. That's, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. too, even the, even the murder is like, that's too gross. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I bash their heads in with a stick, but I won't tell you more about it than that. Yeah. Yeah. Which of course, you know, to our modern sensibilities, that's, you know, every Wednesday night watching law and order, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> no sweat. But so it wasn't originally published in the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, the original edition in in Britain, when the memoirs was published in America, it was included, but the American Mm -hmm. readers reaction to it was they were scandalized by it. So then it was removed from the second edition, American edition of the memoirs. Oh my goodness. And so then was actually out of print for a very long time until it was included in a further collection his last bow which is the fourth collection of stories Hmm. it was published in his last bow but what's funny now is most british editions of the memoirs of sherlock holmes now includes this story and american editions include it in the last bow Hmm. so even though they were published the opposite way originally in the two countries the brits honor where it was supposed to be published But I love the plot, the main story of this one. I have mixed feelings about the opening. (laughs) Um, It starts with a classic Holmes and Watson game that Conan Doyle loves to start stories with, where it's just, let's play a round of deductions. Mm -hmm. Usually it's based on an object. You know, in uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, it starts with, Holmes making Watson deduce things from a a, a walking stick, a blue carbuncle. It starts with Holmes making deductions based on a hat. I blanked on it again. The the one with the pipe. Uh, yellow face. The yellow face. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the yellow face starts with a discussion of the pipe. This one's a little more interesting, I guess, because 
there's not it's not based on an object Holmes is making his deductions based on Watson mm-hmm but like most of these opening games, it doesn't really factor into the actual plot at all. And also it's where Holmes's deductions tend to be at their most ludicrous. <laughs> like, it's really like, come on, really? Yeah. You're just sitting in a room and you see some guy looking around and you're like, oh, yeah, you're thinking about... You're thinking about the Civil War. Yes. <laughs> like, like I, can, I, can, I can walk into a room and see like a, a glass of milk and, or, you know, a, 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 an almost empty glass and see that the little bit of milk at the bottom is still wet and be like, ah, this glass of milk has been drunk recently because the mm-hmm. milk hasn't dried at the bottom. Like, I, <laughs> I, I can see Holmes making deductions based on objects. But I tell you, this week, I spent some time every once in a while, I just kind of like look across the room at my wife, Jess, and just try to figure out what could she possibly be thinking about. And I, I could see like, oh, she's, she's thinking, you know, hard about something. Oh, she's come to maybe a conclusion about it. But like, what it was that she was actually thinking, like, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And and what's funny about it is Holmes himself in, you know, studying Scarlet, the very first Sherlock Holmes story, Watson is like, well, what do you think of Edgar Allan Poe and his detective stories? And Holmes is like, oh, that's just a bunch of hogwash. That's not how it actually works. (laughs) And then in this one, it's it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Watson's Mm -hmm. like, no, you can't really do that. And and Holmes is like, oh, no, you can. And I'm going to do it better than (laughs) Poe ever did. That's right. You know, it, it almost seems like Conan Doyle being like, I, 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 can, I can do what Poe did and better. I'm yeah. upping the stakes. Yeah. The guy doesn't mm-hmm. even move out of his chair. <laughs> he just looks at things in the room. But, you know, he chooses, there, it, the discussion is based around two portraits. And I think there is significance in the two portraits that Conan Doyle chose. He could have chose pictures of anybody you know it could have Mm -hmm. been a picture of the queen you know it could have been a picture or whatever but he specifically chooses two people uh the first general gordon who was general charles george gordon um who would have been a military contemporary of watson he's he Mm -hmm. served in the crimean war but then he became famous for being uh the leader of the ever victorious army are you familiar with the ever victorious army tony I am not. I wasn't either until I started researching. <laughs> it was it was a it was a Chinese army where all the soldiers were Chinese, but it was run by British officers. They were trained by British officers, and British officers commanded them. Um, and they fought in the Taiping Rebellion. General Gordon became a household name in England uh, for that, and so it makes sense that being a military man, that's somebody that. Watson would look up to and want a picture of. Mm-hmm. But the more interesting one is Henry Ward Beecher and what having a picture of him specifically says about Watson. Henry Ward Beecher was an American abolitionist. He's the brother to Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and shared all her, her same abolitionist views. He came to Europe and to England uh, in particular during the Civil War, giving speeches in support of the Union, which is why Holmes mentions, you know, oh, how he was received by our people. Um, That Mm -hmm. would have been what he was talking about. So it's interesting that Watson would have a picture and want to hang on his wall a picture of a well-known abolitionist which kind of develops what you start to see as watson's views on race which is kind of established in the story the yellow face i won't give the listeners spoilers read the yellow face it's great (laughs) but that starts to kind of show watson's feelings on on race and interracial relationships which were very progressive for the time and the fact that he uh, is apparently a fan of a well-known abolitionist further develops this sense of of Watson, which is a nice thing to think about. Watson, he is of a bohemian disposition, and he loves all people. Yes. The passage also does kind of touch on Britain's complicated relationship with America during the Civil War. Mm-hmm. 
Holmes's line about when describing the Civil War, talking about the gallantry on both sides. To my modern American Northern ears, I'm like, gallantry on both sides, Holmes. I mean, come on. <laughs> but, you know, Britain was in a really awkward place during the Civil War because they recognized the authority of the Northern government, of the Union government, but also mm -hmm. the vast majority of the cotton that their textile plants got were from the South. They were economically extremely dependent mm -hmm. on the South. Mm. And... And there were people in England who were very uh, in line with Northern thinking about abolition and, and race relations. Mm -hmm. And there were plenty of people in England who were very much on the Southern side of thinking about race relations. That one little line from Holmes kind of clues you in a little bit about British sentiments about the Civil War and about the South mm -hmm. versus, versus the North. And in fact, mm -hmm. hey, we're lucky that that Britain did not recognize the Confederacy as a legitimate government, which they almost did, but they did not, thanks to the good works of Secretary of State William Seward. Gotta love Willie Seward. We salute you, sir. Mm -hmm. Prevented Britain from recognizing the Confederacy as a government. Got stabbed in the face the same day Lincoln got shot, but survived because your jaw was already wired shut due to falling out of a carriage the week before. And then you went mm. on to continue to serve as the Secretary of State and purchased Alaska for the United States. But this is not the William Seward podcast, as much <laughs> as I would like it to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this, this is not the William Seward fan club. Yes, uh, that's, that's our next podcast. Jay goes on and on about the Lincoln administration. Mm. <laughs> Fertile ground. Yes. Fertile ground for discussion. Yes. Certainly. Uh, Lincoln, another tall, super tall intellectual man of the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. great fondness for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that uh, wraps it up for this conversation about uh, the adventure of the cardboard box. Uh, mm. Tony, always a pleasure to talk with you. Always a pleasure to talk with you, Jay. And listeners, we will... That's... I should... Blah, blah, way to end. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing strong. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> listeners, please join us again if, with our next episode, The Adventure of the Rygate Squires. Ta-ta.